thank you so much for joining us today. Our topic for today is code switching and the climate at PWIs. And this is a part of our March mindfulness series. And so I'm super excited for this. So let's get started. Once again, my name is Dr. Carlos Robinson. I'm super excited for this. So let's jump right into the introduction. What's up, y'all? My name is Los. We're about to get it popping and chop it up about code switching and the climate at PWIs. Kick back, chill, and watch me make it happen. Cool? Translation. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Carlos Robinson. I have a great presentation for you today. We will be discussing code switching and the climate at predominantly white institutions. Please make yourself comfortable and enjoy my great presentation skills. Is that okay with you all? So let's jump off into this and break that down. So that was somewhat of a form of code switching. So when I say, what's up you all, or what's up y'all, What's up is a slang term that's used primarily in a lot of cultures, but in African-American culture, we may use that term. What's up, y'all? Southern term, um, it's not a word, but it, it's supposed to be abbreviation for you all. And so in translation, hello everyone. My name is Los. Now, this is a shorter version. So affectionately, my mother even called me Los at points. And so in our culture, a lot of times we shorten up a name. So for Carlos, Los. If you hear my wife's name, Dr. Rika, her first name is actually Sharika. And so just something that affectionately goes off into our community. And so that's how we may address each other. So in translation, my name is Dr. Carlos Robinson. And I put an emphasis on doctor, and it's something about our upbringing. Whenever we have a communication with really primarily white people, just to be open and honest, as always, we seem to find ourselves talking about our education in order to change the level of conversation that we would then have with that individual. And so when I put that doctor emphasis on my name, sometimes, or really most of the time, it changed the level of conversation for me being an African-American male. So code switching, that will be something that I will play. Master's degree, it'll be something that I may introduce. Now, when we say we're about to get it popping, in the Black culture, we may talk about popping as something exciting, so a great presentation for you today. We're about to chop it up. Chop it up could be talking about we're going to discuss some things. And then at uh, HBCU, predominantly, we talk about PWI. So you may not know the acronym for predominantly white institutions, but Black, historically Black colleges and universities often use the term PWIs. When I say kick back, chill, that's just saying get comfortable be comfortable and watch me make it happen. That means that something is big about to happen at this very moment. And so I'm super excited to say, I, I, I really find myself enjoying presenting to individuals. And then when I say cool, obviously I'm not talking about the temperature cool. I'm talking about when they say cool, as in, okay, is that okay with you all? So that's a breakdown and just some examples of code switching. But before we jump right off into the full presentation to talk about a couple of definitions, I want you to check out this video about code switching. Check this video out or watch this video. We all code switch, but some examples are more effective than others. Okay, let's be real honest. Obama would not be president if he didn't know how to effectively code switch. Obama out. He's really adept at reading his audience. Wagwan, Jamaica. And then putting forth an American English that they can relate to. So what is code switching? Okay, so code switching, let's keep it really simple. Code, so we can think language, and switching, so going 
back and forth between one language and another or one dialect and another. Meet Professor Renee Blake. I am an associate professor in the Department of Linguistics at New York University. I'm also in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis and the Director of Africana Studies. Say that three times fast. Oh, you're funny. <laughs> Code switching is the norm for all of us. So if you just think about whether it's a formal situation versus an informal situation, we're going to be code switching. Usually people think of it in terms of language. So here I am speaking, and I'm speaking not only with words, but I'm also speaking with my face, I'm speaking with my hands. But code switching often has higher stakes for black people. I think it's clear why black people specifically feel the need to code switch. This is Taryn Finley. She's the editor of HuffPost Black Voices. Our blackness isn't accepted in a lot of spaces that are um, critical for our success and our survival. A lot of times we have to dilute and we have to put on a mask. It's a bigger leap for someone who speaks African-American English versus someone who speaks uh, a language that is closer to mainstream English, the language of those in power. But when a black person can't effectively code switch, the result can be catastrophic. The 2013 George Zimmerman trial was a painful reminder of that fact. He was charged with second-degree murder in the shooting of Trayvon Martin. Rachel Gentel was the prosecution's star witness and a close friend of Martin's. And when she testified, she was not code switching. I asked him how the man looked like. He looked like a creepy ass cracker. She took the stand and it became clear that the public wasn't judging the facts of her story. They were judging her language. I don't think she came across as brutally honest. I think she comes across as brutally ignorant. Every time she opens her mouth, her credibility gets chipped away and chipped away. Ultimately, Zimmerman walked free. But the ability to code switch isn't always enough to avoid disaster. Case in point, Sandra Bland. Bland was stopped for failing to signal a lane change. Oh, you seem very irritated. I am. I, I really am. She's speaking a form of standard or mainstream English. Step not... out of the car. But yet, the conversation escalates and goes badly very quickly. Drag me out of my own car. Get out of the car! And then you I will light me? you up. Get out! Wow. Now! Wow. Get out of the car! Ready for a failure to signal. You're doing all of this for Get over there. And so here what I think is happening and what we seem to understand is that there's something about the black expression that is different or can be misconstrued. Despite her ability to code switch, Bland was arrested. She was later found dead in her jail cell. Our blackness inherently says trouble in a lot of white spaces, in a lot of public spaces. That's why so many people feel threatened and want to call the cops when they see a black person doing something as benign as waiting for a business meeting to start in Starbucks. So it sounds like racism is the root cause of all of this. We haven't, as a country, confronted racism and really got into the roots of why we code switch, why we feel like we have to straighten our hair in order to get a job, even if we don't want to. That concerns me, because I think the black body is like every other body, a beautiful body, and should be loved and respected, and not feel anxiety as you walk through the world on a daily basis. I know I feel that anxiety because I do want to be accepted by the world in which I live. Code switching can help black people navigate white spaces. But at the end of the day, it's not enough to overcome racism. Code switching and respectability politics don't protect us all the time. We're still black. So, pretty heavy video. Really like that video because it's short and it gets straight to the point. So let's talk about two definitions of code switching. So first, alternating or combining languages. And then we'll jump off into using different dialects, accents, and mannerisms. So let's jump right into this first one. So alternating and combining languages. This linguist, linguistic code switching could be used most commonly with bilingual or multilingual communities. And why would they use these different methods? To need to fit in a group. So say for a social setting in high school, they may want to 
get into their cultural group that's inside of that high school and they may bounce back and forth with language languages from English, from Spanish, from you know any kind of different language in which they need to speak to fit in with that group. Or it could be a force of habit. So say if they're meeting with their grandparent, grandparent speaks this language as a first language, they may go right off into that as a force of habit to talk to their grandparents in that specific language or just even at home or to convey a thought or concept. So thoughts and concepts in certain individuals that use different languages interchangeably, they may need to think back to maybe what their first language is in order to make sure they get a grasp of the concept within their thought process in their language and their culture. Although you cannot just plug in any words and ignore grammatical rules, it still must uh, make sense and be understandable in a natural setting. So what I said as my introduction in the beginning, people from where I come from, my cultural background, they would have understood exactly what I meant. So let's jump into the, using the different dialects, accents, and mannerisms. So this sociolinguistic perspective, we're talking about it occurs in social groups. So for example, if you are in a high school and you've graduated or you, you've college and you graduated and you go back to a reunion, you may talk to your old buddies in a different way than which you will, in which you will talk to your colleagues in a different way. So that, that type of social group. So if you're outside of your norm, your daily work life, you might find yourself code switching and just talking freely as you would as if you were at home. Maybe primarily based on age. So I work at a university as a director of admissions and I have students come in and talk to me all the time. So these students, they'll come in and they use their own terms. And so I was talking to a student one day and I was giving him some advice. I was telling him all of these things that he should, hey, you should do this, go do that, make sure you do this, you may you do that. And so he said this one, one little uh, statement. He said, say less, Mr. Robinson. I said, I, I, what do you mean? You, you don't want me to say any more of what's going on? But what he was telling me was, say less. You don't have to say any more. I completely understand. I respect what you're telling me. I'm about to go make things happen. I'm about to go do what you're telling me I need to do. But those different age uh, differences show a different level of code switching when it comes to certain individuals in their age. Now, what about class? So dep depending on your, your economic status or how much money you, you receive and what class you may fall into, you, you may code switch. So for example, my wife and I, she took me to Mahogany Steakhouse. I'm gonna tell you right now, we're just starting to get a little money. So she treated me to Mahogany Steakhouse for my birthday last year. Super excited. We go in and we look at the menu, a lot of different things. We, we just don't really understand different steaks and different appetizers and just like, whoa, wait a minute. Not, not, our, not our level of income place to eat that we eat regularly. So Particularly, you can hear people behind you saying all of these different things and ordering all this, we want this, you want that, we want this. And so they were doing a form of code switching based off of their comfort level in their class. Geographic locations, obviously talking about the Southern accent, the Northern accent, the West, West Coast, the Western accent, the Eastern accent, all of these different accents could be part of code switching. Upbringing, mannerisms, those things, thank you, yes, sir, no, sir, excuse me, please. Those type of things could be possible code switching. When we're talking about ethnic, as I mentioned in my introduction, super fun. I know I probably caught you off guard if you got to see the introduction, but that's a part of code switching. I would be able to go into a different community where I come from, predominantly Black community, and talk to them in a different manner. But I'm also able to go into um, a, a different community with millionaires or lawyers and whoever and be able to talk to them as well. But ethnic, ethnically, I, I can go into many different communities and code switch, switch in that regard. So all of these play a critical role in how and when people code switch. So why do we code switch? Here are five reasons on why we code switch. Number one, our lizard brains take over. Now, this is that little part of your brain that, that kind of sp sparks up alarms, like give you a sense of, you know, oh, oh, wait a minute, 
I got to make sure I be careful or, you know, that intuition or that gut feeling, that part of your brain that that says mm, you might want to be careful on how you move. So, for example, if I go into a room full of, let's just say, white people, white males. However, I won't go in and talk the way I would talk to my family back at home. I would then have to code switch and talk to them in a manner in which they would understand what I'm trying to convey or to be able to fit in, which is number two. I want to fit in. People want to fit in in different sectors. And so if you find yourself code switching for an interview, this is kind of what it is. You want to be fit in. You want to fit in this group. You, you know, say for, for example, uh, students, uh, black students at predominantly white high schools. I had a student come up. She went to Bethany High School. She says she was the only black person in her entire class. <sighs> what? Only black person in her entire class. And she said it's roughly about 20 black students at Bethany High School out of 500. So you got to believe that she does a lot of code switching. Her parents are from St. Louis, which is predominantly black African-American community. It's a lot of people out there um, that would have that type of cultural background. They moved to Oklahoma. They wanted to find a great place where education will be at the forefront of, for their baby. And so they moved to Bethany, right there where you all are, Southern Nazarene in that area. But this young lady is going into a setting which may be unknown to her. So she may listen to music that she wouldn't normally listen to, watch videos, or have conversations. But you better believe when she go back home to talk to her Black parents, they're going to talk about things that's relatable to them. Or again, number three, you want to get something, kind of going back to an interview. Or say if you want to get out of a ticket, oh my God, officer, please don't grab me. You're code switching to get something that you want. Or you code switching and you're so proper to get this job. That is a form of code switching for that said environment. Sometimes uh, those cultures that can speak different languages, they may code switch to say something in secret. And that doesn't mean that it always has, has to be something bad. It could be anything. It could be anything such as, hmm, she's cute or he's cute, you know, and they said that to each other, a friend, and because they can say that in secret. And then last but not least, number five, to convey a thought. We talked about this once again. If your culture language is not English, English and you were raised on a different language, sometimes in order for that concept or that thought to be able to come to fruition, you would have to probably switch back to a certain language or a certain cultural feel in order to understand that thought. So let me tell you about a code switching epic fail on my part. So I'm pretty sure you all know, super excited about this. SNU had their first doctoral group to go through um, last year in December. My wife and I, first in our families to be doctors in an entire family's history, we are the first doctors. Super excited. I'm just, I'm stoked. So I'm walking across stage and Dr. Crusoe calls my name, Dr. Carlos M. Robinson. I'm like, oh, I'm so excited. This is, this is amazing. My family's out there. Her family's out there. We're all going crazy. And so as I walk across the stage, I go to shake President Newman's hand. And I go shake his hand. And this is a regular handshake, right? Common handshake. But what I did was I started to cold switch into a handshake that we would do primarily in an African-American community. So you go into a handshake and then you find yourself kind of locking like this and saying, thank you, I appreciate you. And then you may close it out like you're solid. Man, you're an awesome person. President Newman didn't know what I was doing. He, we had this awkward little fumble of the hand. I was like, okay, what just happened? So he had to, hey, don't miss your picture. You know, so I kind of turned and tried to get my picture. I almost missed my on stage picture. So how could this possibly be an epic code switch failure? Well, if President Newman didn't know what I was doing, he would assume that I just don't know how to shake a hand. Like, what is this guy got going on? He can't even shake a hand properly. But if he only understood, or if we were in that type of relationship where he knew my culture, or I knew his culture, Whenever I go into embracing with this different type of handshake that's primarily done into our community, the Black community, that means I admire you. 
I appreciate everything that you've done. Thank you for approving this program. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to further our education at that different level. So it could be if we never had that conversation, shh, don't tell him, all right? He might be, he probably don't even remember it. But I thought it was funny. I told my wife when I sat down, I was like, oops, I don't know why I did that, but I was super excited. I guess that's why. But it could have been a failure because you're like, oh, you know, if, what if I wanted to hire this guy for a job or something? He don't even know how to shake hands. That was awkward. Well, miscommunication on my part. My bad, President Newman. Don't tell him, though. All right. So just jump right off into it. Uh, the climate at PWIs, again, predominantly white institutions. Now, my dissertation topic, I wanted to do something that spoke to me. My dissertation topic was this, identity representation, exploring the influences that administrators of color have on students of color at predominantly white institutions. So I went to an all black high school and I went to OCCC then I went to Oklahoma City University. Then I went to Southern Nazarene for my master's and my doctorate to predominantly white institutions. I always dreamed to become a president of a college or a university once I found myself in student leadership, president of Black Student Association, student body president, president of NAACP Youth Council. Every role that I got into, it was a president's role. So I really found myself really being great at leadership. But when I went to look for people that looked like me, I didn't see anybody. I didn't see black presidents. I barely, you know, I, I did hardly ever seen a, a, a president of color um, and a vice president level, or, you know, may see some directors here and there, but it was just kind of somewhat disheartening. So when I had an opportunity to write my dissertation, I wanted to write it with purpose. And so this is what I wrote it over. So my problem statement. Research says that there is facts showing that there is a shortage in representation for ethnically minoritized administrators at colleges and universities. However, institutions have failed to create an inclusive atmosphere for administrators of color. Therefore, an absence of mentoring and assistance from administrators of color has been linked to the failure of keeping people of color within universities and colleges. So the purpose, I wanted to explore the lived experiences of four administrators of color at PWIs. I wanted to talk to them about how they obtain their leadership roles. Also, how they use those, those positions to mentor students of color. So I had these five research questions that I went off of. Question number one. I wanted to know about their leadership experience and their background all the way back from when they were in grade school. What was your upbringing? What, what were you involved in? Question number two, I wanted to see what was assisting them towards their path to leadership, their trajectory in leadership, what assisted them to get and obtain the roles that they currently have. Question number three, I wanted to talk about it, challenges and barriers from when you were younger to to this day, let's talk about those challenges and barriers just in case we can educate other people of color that's looking to get in the same roles you all are in. Question number four, mentorship. How did you support students of color within your spaces and in your current roles at your predominantly white institutions? And then question number five, how race shaped their life experiences? Just talking about their race in general. So theoretical framework was critical race theory. Don't get me. I'm not the one that's against it. I don't know. But it's a big topic right now, especially in the state of Oklahoma. But we talked about the academic structure derived from the critical legal studies that addresses society's racial inequalities within higher education. And so I went off of these five tenets and I broke down the interviews that I had with my participants. Now, the research method was obviously, you may have got it, it was a qualitative narrative inquiry. It was an opportunity to sit down with these administrators of color and talk, to, talk about their lived experiences, that rich, that thick, rich description of their life and what they've gone through. Things that put them in a, put them in a safe space, a built rapport with them. It was an instant connection. They became open and honest throughout the entire interview process. 
Now, COVID didn't allow, allow me to do the interviews in person, but we did have an opportunity to do them through Zoom. We turned on our cameras. The first interview, we talked about their history and motivation for pursuing their careers in higher education as administrators. And then the interview number two, we dove into their students, uh, how they influence students of color and their perceptions on how society and culture intersects with race and power at predominantly white institutions. So here are my findings. I had a ton of thin things that popped out of this. We had about 19 things, but I had to cluster them in to these five. Theme number one, empowerment of worth. Theme number two, influence of mind. Theme number three, reassurance of purpose. Theme number four, development of structure. Theme number five, authenticity of reality. So let's jump into it. Theme number one, empowerment of worth meant someone or something gave the participants power or strength to be all that they can be. So whether it be their parents or whether it be a mentor or a colleague, something or something that, you know, I have one that had just a tragic life event near death empowered him, gave him the strength to say, I'm going to go off and be the best that I can be at life because my life flashed before my eyes. My parents worked so hard, tirelessly to get me where I am today. I'm going to do whatever I can to be successful. So theme number two, influence of mind refers to who or what affected the drive to become an administrator and coincidentally mentors of students of color. So it was someone or something that influenced their minds. A couple of them said it was a white individual that they worked with that said, you're awesome. You're a person that I can see in this next level. You should go apply for that position. You're awesome. I want to bring you up to this next level because you're qualified. You check every single box and we want you to be in this position. Who, me? It could be a culture shock, and it was a culture shock for them because they're a predominantly white institution, and a lot of times they've been overlooked for said positions. Theme three, reassurance of purpose is the fact that it took something or someone to keep the participants in line with their ground, grounds of existence. So what I mean there was it was times where they just wanted to give up, just like it just doesn't make sense. Uh, people getting placed in positions before me or getting recognitions and accolades, and you can feel it as a person of color in a predominantly white space that you're not being recognized accordingly. But it was something like a student that came up to him and said, you changed my life. Student of color said, hey, I look up to you. I want to be like you when I grow up. I remember these things when I was working in a predominantly white institution, and I had those students that gravitated to me it told me that I was everything to them. That kept me grounded. Same with the participants. Reassurance of their purpose kept them and gave them the fortitude to continue to persevere, continue to go and, and, and just kind of, you know, block all of the things out that may be working against them and continue to strive to be the best that they could be. Thing number four, development of structure is the idea of construction before destruction when it comes to the success of students of color. If you've known your research or if you've been in any space of higher education, you would know that African-American males fail at alarming rates. Don't graduate. They're not retained. They don't graduate. Same with the African-American culture, so on and so on down the line. So, they said that the best way to do it is teach these students early on something that they never knew in the first place. So constructing them with the mindset of you're going to have to work twice as hard to be better than or just equal to a white person is what they said. They also said you have to work three times as hard to be even better. And so creating this mindset of you're going into this unknown environment, talking to the students of color and being able to perform at a level in which no one in your family has ever performed. So you're developing a mindset, you're creating a platform for these students that's in this first generation. Can't go back and say, hey, mom, how was college? Hey, dad, how was college? 
but they develop that structure for those students to be successful. And theme number five, authenticity of reality speaks to the research that addresses the disparities of how society and culture intersect with race and power. So what the participants said was, we understand that, you know, it's a disparity. I mean, we're just, it's one of those things that our culture is not the dominant culture. So the white culture get to decide how things look. With that being said, they're willing to compromise or they're willing to conform to be able to fit in, to sit at the table with white individuals to talk about the things that make people of color uncomfortable in these spaces, how they may have been singled out or how a statement was kind of offensive to a person of color, a student of color, and having conversations like this. They've said, if we go in and we say, well, this is not fair, and we're, you know, and they cr create a big fuss and then they turn into the typical angry black woman or so on and so forth, then they won't have their voices heard. So they knew that they had to do whatever it takes. So being realistic about where they are, how they had to maintain a certain level of just, you know, dignity, respect or whatever you want to call it in order to be at the table to have the conversations like we're having now. So kudos to Dr. Crusoe for inviting me to even present my presentation. Super excited about that part. But they said, this is what starts the conversation. You create a platform. You welcome and invite people to have the discussions and talk about it. And once the cultures get to understand in each other, more likely to work together. So the conclusions of my study. I noticed that each participant had both parents in their life that had a positive and a strong influence on their success. The parents already knew what the students were set up against. You know, I, I know you're gonna be out in the world that's just not, it's just unfair world, it's cruel in, in a sense. And so you're out there, but we're gonna tell you everything that you need to do. As long as you listen to us, as long as you further your education, as long as you stay in line, you're more likely to be successful. They also talk about they were influenced by somewhere or something, you know, the, it, it, that took them a long way. So it was someone that told them, look, go for it. You should be the dean. I'm, I'm looking at our colleagues. Uh, so maybe, a, you know, I think these two individuals said it was a white person said, hey, you are fit. That imposter syndrome set in a lot of times for people of color. No, we're not. I don't believe it. You know, I've been held back. I've worked so hard. I worked tirelessly to get where I'm at today. I don't think they believe that I can be the person or I don't think I could get in this position and people will actually listen to me, even though I check every single box and more. But it was someone or something that said you could and they ran with that. It was also turning their purpose into confidence was a great philosophy for them. So they talked about that ground existence. Why am I here? Why do I do what I do and go through what I go through? Mm, it's students that look up to me. There are opportunities where we can really break down the barriers and work together and then be a magnificent thing to see. And so that turned that, that, that purpose turned into confidence, gave them the strength to continue to move forward to accomplish their ultimate goals. Then they talked about how it was a building process to become an administrator. I mentioned some of those things about how conforming to a society um, of, of, of a different culture was something that they had to do. I had one of them talked about how he came in and used to wear the, the light powder pink polo shirt button ups and you know lime green and purple. He had all of the live colors and he'll come in with his suits he was the only black guy in the room in an administrative position. And so he already stuck out like a sore thumb. And so what he noticed was, you know, all of the white individuals in the room had on a white shirt and a university tie or right, white blouse and black pants or black dresses or something along those lines. And he's like, I'm the only one standing out. Maybe I might be misunderstood if I dress the way that I feel I could dress. My culture dressed this way in our culture, a lot of colors, kind of the African roots to, to our lives, but just wasn't what worked best. 
he even talked about how just being a big black guy, he may get into uh, a conversation with someone at the table and he may lean in and just kind of go and talk about it. He said he even felt the presence of his colleagues leaning back as if he was going to harm them or something along those lines. He was, so now he's learned to just sit back and, you know, I'm not going to get loud. I'm not going to raise my voice because I don't want to be misunderstood. But it took a lot of building of that type of mindset and conforming and making sure that you're not incorrect or just politically correct and all of these different things that they talked about in order to be able to continue the conversations about diversifying their institutions. And then last but not least, there's a difference between knowing and doing something. We know that there are disparities, whether we talk about it or not, or people are comfortable or not. Throughout my entire college career, entire college career, it was some instance that made me uncomfortable as a person of color. It's like, hmm, that I, I felt something about this situation where I, I don't feel like I, I belong or I had to overprove myself or overcompensate or the imposter syndrome set in or I felt that somebody thought I was lazy. But, you know, I thought about things that I've done and I've accomplished. I had to not let that imposter syndrome sink in because I never missed one MBA class when I was in my entire MBA program at Southern Nazarene. Why am I questioning whether or not I'm worthy to move forward for a job position or or a assignment, whether I got the assignment or not, and the professor gives you know, a little harder time on me than you know, my, my counterpart, you didn't say much. So those type of instances happen all the time. A lot of times we don't say anything as people of color because we are afraid of the repercussions or something that may happen to us bad or poor in our favor because we thought that was necessary to speak up about our discomfort. And so I can tell you right now, I'm pretty sure Dr. Crusoe and any diversity um, leader on any campus, they get an earful because we'll come to them because that's our sense of belonging to talk about these things. And so that's what they said, knowing that these things are happening, but what are you doing? And so they talked about how they in, implemented mentor programs. They talked about how they included diversity training and then in, in, in hiring process or just training in general and seminars and workshops like this. So kudos to SNU for even presenting a platform to have these discussions. And so as I start to bring my presentation to the close and, and open the floor for any questions, let's talk about the implications of the study. So research, it talked mostly about just the cultural understanding, the cultural presence, improved engagement of working with students of color, the intercultural skills within the community, the cultural responsiveness. responsiveness. You gotta understand that cultures are different. We have different backgrounds. We move different. We think different. Our parents are different. But if nobody embraces our difference or no one is at the table to talk about our differences, we are uncomfortable. Whether you hear us say it or not, we are uncomfortable. We'll sit in a room and we'll stay quiet. But when we get home, we'll have a, a deep conversation on trying to really, am I in the right space? Is this right for me? And it takes a lot of perseverance, a lot of fortitude to continue to push forward. But implementing trainings, employee training at the front door, if this person is qualified, don't, don't not hire them or don't not offer them an interview because you can't say their name. You can ask us, ask, you know, Sharika. A lot of people mess up my wife's name all the time, so she go with Rika for short, but don't, don't be afraid to offer the opportunity and ask, how do you, and those are the things they were saying within my, my study. Encouragement that diversity is okay. The communi communication about how can we diversify our institutions, the commitment to diversifying our institution, and then obviously providing a platform for students of color, a mentor platform for students of color to feel that sense of belonging within predominantly white spaces. And so the practice of my study is going to just continue uh, adding to the growing body of information around identity representation at predominantly white institutions and provide a stronger understanding of the value of diversity in higher education. And so that concludes my presentation. It was a lot. I'm sorry I gave you an earful, but I opened the floor for questions at this time, and I do want to thank you so much for your time. Any questions?
Yes, Dr. Robin, thank you so much for this presentation. I found it very insight, insightful and um, um, actually in my work, I'm, I'm the program director of the Master Leadership Program here at SNU. And um, I focus a couple of our courses on this notion of um, maybe not necessarily code switching, but this notion of underrepresented populations within PWIs and how can leaders recognize um, some of the struggles that they might be going through that aren't even evident. And code switching is definitely, I think, playing a major part in that. How do you, or did you come across any research um, or in, in the literature as you were studying? How did, um, did you come, or how did you handle work with um, like comfort levels, if, 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 if that's the right term? Because if, if someone is having to live in this um, environment and work in this environment where they aren't able to be themselves, maybe, maybe that's the right term, um, does that lead to um, lower levels of retention, which I'm assuming it does, but then outside of code switching, what, what are some other supports that can be in place for that? So great question. Thank you, Michael Houston. I appreciate that and appreciate the work that you do. So when it comes to comfort level, I was just talking to my wife about this. We didn't turn into some naked and afraid fans. And this is the best way I can. I don't know if you ever seen this. It's about you know, people go out in the middle of some strange jungle or something like that naked, a male and a female, and they got to survive for 21 days. For most students of color, that's what it feels like going into higher education. This is an unknown environment. This is something that you're walking into. And if you don't have all of the resources necessary, you're more than likely going to fail. If you don't have the support necessary, you're more than likely going to fail. And I'm not saying make additional accommodations to just say, well, people of color just get everything that they need, but recognize the differences. And so, for example, in our lives, again, we don't have parents, we don't have individuals that tell us what we need to know on how to survive college. And so we're out in this wilderness of trying to figure it out. So it's really about the resources and recognizing that your students of color may be going through an identity crisis at this moment. This is brand new. So how do you embrace that student and tell them that it's okay? I'll give you a little more time. I need you to do this. I need you to do that. I believe in you. I think you're smart enough to get this. Here are the resources. Here are the mentor programs. I encourage this. I encourage that. And just really that, kind of that pat on the back, um, really putting yourself in that student's shoes. So for example, you can feel a disconnect. You can feel a disconnect because people are afraid to engage. You could tell when it's a difference between the white culture. Like, have you ever been around black people before? And people that's like, I'm cool. I don't, you know, I wouldn't want to say you don't see color. Let's just be realistic. But saying that your color does not bother me. You're a human like I'm a human and I'm going to treat you the same way. If I give these resources to this student, a white student, I'll give the same resources to you. Equal playing field. Simple enough. Enough. And if we don't find that, and we've seen it a lot of times where it's like, I seen her get more time than us or got accommodations uh, over what we've asked for, those type of things, it really sets us back and really question us whether or not we continue to move forward in this space. So it's about bringing that sense of belonging to the student. Um, obviously, don't overcompensate and embarrass and say, hey, we want to make sure all the black students, are you okay? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is treat us equally, treat students equally, make them feel like they belong, provide them with resources, support um, the, the diversity and in inclusion and the, um, the intercultural and learning and engagement office and, and come to these seminars and have these discussions and talk about how we can really accommodate the needs of the students of color because they are in an unknown environment and it is different to have a cultural shift in the middle of your life. Um, Dr. So Robinson, awesome. oh, I'm sorry. No, you're all right. Thanks, uh, Michael. Dr. Ghost Bear, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing? Thank oh, you I'm, so much. I'm super excited. Great, great thought provoking presentation. Thank you. Um, my question is so, what are next steps for you in your line of inquiry? Great question, Dr. Ghostbear. Thank you so much. My wife love you. I love you as well. But my wife always talk about your class. You were super awesome and you made it feel welcoming. So thank you. Kudos to you. I'm going to give you a shout out there. So my ultimate goal in life is to be a president of a college or a university. 
And so I'm currently a director of admissions, recruitment and outreach. And then I'll, you know, obviously look up the trajectory to see how far I can go. I thought it was really interesting that uh, one of the committee members uh, on my dissertation committee pointed out the fact that this was probably the first time, which it was, that I had an opportunity to speak to people of color that are in the positions that I desire to be in kind of blew my mind. I never thought about it. I was like, you are right. This is kind of an interesting study for me and so impactful for me to be able to just see that it is possible and, and hear their stories and continue to, I can keep moving forward. So that's really my ultimate goal. Uh, but really my, my, I guess my purpose in life is to be an educator, to be a support system to uh, anyone, anyone that's looking to further their education. And then obviously, um, our African-American males are failing at alarming rates, and I want to be an example. I grew up on the northeast side of Oklahoma. My life was not promised to be a doctor, and, and I knew that early on, and so I decided to see something different and do something different, and so that's why I am where I am. So higher education is definitely going to be something, if not a you know, podcast or YouTube or something that continues to educate the body of people in order for us all to continue to move forward as equally as possible. Thanks for that question. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Robinson. Hi, Hi this is Romilia Scroggins from Tulsa. Oh, nice to meet you, Ms. Scroggins. How can I answer any questions you have? This is just a follow-up. Um, so you desire to be uh, president you know, of um, higher education. Are you leaning one way or the other to like maybe an HBCU or WI or does it matter to you? That is a great question. And it actually, I think you peeked in on my uh, dissertation committee or my defense because somebody asked me that same question. And I'm going to give you the same answer because it was a real answer when I gave it to them. I'm open to either way. So I worked at OCCC for 14 years. So I'm familiar with the space of working in a predominantly white institution. And I know how important it was for me to be there. I currently work at Langston University as the director of admissions uh, and HBCU Historically Black College and University. And I even have a greater impact because the body of students that I serve, a lot of them come from where I come from. A lot of them look at me as the successful version of them. So I'm open to either way. I know at HBCUs, it's a plethora of individuals that's there supporting those students to be successful because they knew what they signed up for to do for that particular body of students. But also it's even greater of an importance uh, in some sense to be at a predominantly white institution to help those students navigate that space. And so once they get into uh, Southern Nazarene or wherever, who's actually helping them through? So I would love to be, and that's why I did my dissertation, I would love to also be, you know, an administrator at a predominantly white institution, because I believe I have a lot that I can bring to the table in order to answer the question or help may, maybe minimize uh, the retention, the low retention rates and graduations of graduation rates of people of color. So I'm open to ever, whatever, but just, I guess, to make a short answer is wherever God leads me. I'm a firm believer if he says this way and the doors open that way, I'm walking through the doors that God has opened and provided for me. Absolutely. God bless you. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Robinson. Yep. Yes, sir. I can't see my name. Oh, great. Oh, I think you may have put yourself back on mute or was it me? Oh, can oh yeah, I think I asked. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yep. So excellent presentation. Um, I actually did a brief presentation last week in the meeting. I was in on code switching. I wish I would move that meeting to next week after I heard you and all the good research you've done uh, to uh, help my presentation. Uh, but my question is, uh, being African-American male at a PWI, and I grew up going to PWIs um, as, as well, but in this field, there's been a debate. I'm sure you come, you know, we're trying to, you know, create room and try to code switch in these predominantly white institutions. And was there was anything in your research that kind of lent to, you know, that kind of um, tug of war back and forth of we're trying to create spaces in these spaces that were never created for us versus the HBCUs 
Um, did anyone mention or hint to that? Um, and I'll say for me, like I've been to Peter, but there's always that sense of, you know, were you trying to build at a place that was never built for you versus building our own or instead of bringing what we offer to the table, we just set our own table. Did anything lend to that in your research? Yeah, absolutely. So a few of the participants just mentioned that you really got to think historically black back to where blacks were not accepted to predominantly white spaces. And that was the main reason why historically black universities were created. And so they talked about um, how the space uh, at most of these institutions was, was really created for the white male. It had no thought of a person of color being in this space, let alone women. And then, you know, eventually it became white women. And then, you know, when you got an opportunity to educate folks, uh, the state of Oklahoma years ago said, hey, we're not we're not going to give space in, in our institutions. They can create their own space, speaking to people of color to, to go off. And that's when Langston University was created back in 1897. But over time, you know, segregation and, you know, desegregation and all of those things start to come about. And so they talked about how it was not that part of the culture. And so really the structure of most of these institutions are currently set up where it does not make sense for people of color because it was not created for them. And so that's why the relevance of black student associations and Miss Black pageants and all of these special interest organizations for Hispanics or whomever uh, were created. And then the diversity and inclusion offices, the intercultural and learning and engagement offices were created in order to provide a sense of belonging. So they did recognize that often in my study, just to speak to the idea of space was not created uh, for people of color. And then until we recognize that, I think the policies and the structures and, and the people, um, that make the powers that be at the institutions until they look to change some of those things, it will always be an uncomfortable space because it just wasn't made for us and it wasn't something that um, was of interest. And so even currently to this day, it can be as small as let's raise the price in the cafeteria on hamburgers. Well, you know, uh, I'm a first generation college student coming from a home that we don't have a college fund set up. So who was sitting at the table to make that decision? Or let's change the curriculum to be this, or let's remove this from the curriculum um, altogether. Uh, we find that, that that alone can cancel out a student of color's uh, opportunities to further education. So it was a lot of deep, th deep things there, Keith, that uh, you and I can get offline and talk about. Um, but we, they did make mention to it. it wasn't created for us in the first place and we were able to get into these systems, but uh, most institutions have not wholeheartedly embraced the idea of diversification. A lot of people kind of put a band on, band on a situation and don't have presentations like this, but they have an office and the office may not get the funding. They talked about this office may not get the funding necessary to put on programs. The office may not get the funding to send these students off on a field trip. They need that extra mile of encouragement and reassurance um, that they are in the right space and they are doing what's best for their family and their lives. And then ultimately, these individuals go off and be great in what they do um, in our communities rather than being a crutch to the community, you know, welfare and so on and so forth uh, with the lack of education. And so great question, um, we can definitely you know, link up and figure out, get together. We can definitely uh, get together and talk about just where you are. And I appreciate all the work that you do as well. Thank you. And I wish you the best. And yeah, I'll get your contact information and yeah, we can uh, discuss it further in the future. Awesome. Sounds like a plan. And I'll put it in the chat box now. And as we're whirling to the last three minutes, any other questions? And you all can all feel free to just get my number and um, I look forward to just connecting with you on anything that you may want to connect with me about or if I can be a resource or, you know, even I had, um, it's just, you know, we're going to remain honest, but I even had white colleagues that I grew up with or they helped kind of mentor me through my college career and they literally came to me just like, how can I be comfortable in this situation? And I was able to help them, like, just be natural, really, just be you, but don't you know, one of those, we can feel it. We can tell whether or not you're genuine and so on. And so, so small things like that, um, getting to know our culture, getting to know any culture, or, or recognizing differences and embracing differences 
is always a great way to go. If not, we will continue to lose people of color. They'll come in and, you know, football players and they can, you know, be with coaches that may not understand their backgrounds and they play football, but they know if they break their leg or ankle, then they're out. And now they're at your institution trying to figure out a way, but they were athlete students rather than student athletes. They came here for an athletic opportunity, but I never knew how to be a student. So, so many things that we can talk about and hopefully this just really just opens the door for the conversation and communications to move forward. And I definitely look forward to being able to provide that opportunity. So Dr. Lease, would you like to come in and just kind of talk about your link and welcome folks to the next uh, March Mindfulness? And I do want to thank you all for your time. Thank you very much. We greatly appreciate your work on this topic and uh, it's been a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much.